I'm just gonna introduce myself. I'm gonna let Ross turn down the music and then I'm gonna introduce myself and talk a little bit about the club because I don't think you guys uh, know when the club actually started. So we started this club, Inter-Tribal Student Union, in 2016. And since then we've uh, gone into three years and two of our members actually graduated and they're both, one just finished at UC Davis and one is attending UC Davis now and so we have a third uh, member that is graduating. So it's been in existence since 2016. I'm Maria Spencer and I'm the club advisor for Intertribal Student Union. Uh, the interesting thing about the club is, is that Native Americans, there was a large uh, a cohort of Native Americans that attended uh, Merritt College a long time ago. Uh, and there used to be powwows up here, I understand, and a lot of activities that took place up on this hill that it kind of disappeared uh, over the last 25 years or so. And when I uh, started working here, I realized that there was a trickle of Native American students that were amongst the uh, other students that kind of did not self-identify that they were Native Americans. And so I said, uh, when my daughter enrolled here, I said, let's uh, work with uh, Quinton. And uh, he was the first president of Intertribal Student Union. And so he since then came on and moved on, and now we're bringing up the ranks. So, we're growing out the population now. We've been doing lots of outreach and recruitment in the community. We've been doing a lot of civic engagement, involving ourselves and making ourselves present so that more Native American students can uh, kind of join the ranks of their, um, their brothers and sisters up here. So with that ado, I would like to actually acknowledge the Intertribal Student Club at this moment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Ross Harding who came in on his first semester and we met and found out he was already attending school here earlier and didn't know we had a club. And so as soon as he found out, he came through and we anointed him as the president of the Intertribal Student Union. He was just like, oh, okay, I said, it's a big responsibility. But he is, oh, uh, I can't even pronounce this properly, but it's uh, Olamenko. Uh, he's actually Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo. Uh, and he's going to tell you a little bit about that background when he does his presentation. Um, he's a single dad, he's a go-getter, he's worked on special projects in and around the community and one you'll be hearing uh, soon about his work and research, uh, focusing on um, the situation that's happening with the women, uh, indigenous women and girls that are uh, being murdered across the nation, that are, his statistics are really growing high and it's not really um, put out in social media or tabloids, like you're just not even... It's not even discussed, not even in newspapers. I don't really see discussions happening in that. Uh, and so he's going to cover the rates and how fast they're growing and the special campaign that is that is developing because of these rates. Uh, the next person, and so Ross, you can stand up and you can just at least show who you are. So when you're on campus, you'll see Ross. And then there's Catherine, uh, Catherine Barimentos who is uh, Apache and Arapaho, and she is, um, I want to say, part of relocation too, because her mom uh, is kind of heavily involved in the Native American community, and she dances. She's also a single mom. She's, um, she's going to tell you and introduce herself as well, but she's also, um, I believe, I'm not even sure what their majors are, because she's focusing all on her sciences right now, so it can lead to any direction. When you say sciences, it can branch off to many areas. So at this point, um, I'd like to, we have a few others, and they're in class, so we still have Isaiah Yazi, who's Navajo, and then we have Melvin Vieras, and he moves around a lot, and um, he's a re-entry student. Is he here? Melvin Vieras, well, he's a re-entry student. Uh, he also is in his, like, going into his second semester here. Um, more important to note about him is he actually has multiple jobs. Not only is he a full-time student, but he also uh, works for the um, Friendship House of American Indians. Uh, it's a residential uh, drug and alcohol treatment facility in San Francisco, and he's actually, I call him the night watchman. So it's interesting that he can pull 
all day of classwork and then go there to work and he like covers graveyard you know uh, supporting that and so I give him a lot of props for that kind of work because his industry's focus is in social welfare and social work and drug and alcohol rehabilitations for Native Americans and so uh, he's right on point for that. Um, without further ado I'd like to um, bring on our first guest speaker. Um, it's unfortunate that um, I had to call her at the last minute and say, can you help me out, Linda? <laughs> I need a filler for my first presentation uh, that couldn't make it uh, today. But this is Linda Lilly. Um, she is Navajo in Laguna Puebla. She is uh, part of both, uh, shares in both cultures. But more importantly is she's uh, a mother, a grandmother, a sister, an aunt. Uh, and certainly and she's my sister-in-law, so I love her dearly and I'm really happy that she's going to be covering a really um, difficult piece because it's part of relocation and uh, she's going to explain to you what that's all about. So come on up, Linda. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Linda Lilly. Uh, some of you may know me, some of you may not, uh, but I want to introduce myself first. Uh, as always, we go with our mother's tribe. So, um, and our clan, um, and I am Laguna Pueblo and Navajo. Uh, my grandparents, my great-great-grandparents were Delia and Valentino Concho. My grandmother was Edna and Samuel Anderson, and my mother and father were Genevieve and Horace Spencer. And I grew up in a village called Siama. Uh, which is located in Laguna, 45 miles west of Albuquerque. And, um, and in the, the village, it's, it's pretty large, pretty spread, but we have a little area called, um, they call it New York. I don't know how we got that, but that's where um, I grew up. And everybody in New York is related to one another. So if you can imagine, back in the in 1960s, uh, I grew up in a, uh, in a desert area, uh, a farming area. My grandmother had a uh, cornfield that was longer than this room. Uh, she, had, she grew melons, she grew chili, she drew, grew all the vegetables, um, and mainly corn. She had a huge oven, outside oven, and she would bake bread. My uncles, my grandfathers, they were all hunters. So we had a lot of um, deer meat. Um, my my um, grandfathers, they had, they had cows, they raised sheep. So everything, oh, and we also had chickens. So everything was all fresh. The only time we went to town was maybe once every two weeks just to get staples like um, sugar, flour, uh, beverages, etc. So that was my lifestyle. Really nice, simple. Um, I grew up in an adobe home, two rooms, uh, no flooring, no bathroom, no electricity. Uh, very, very simple life. It was, it was nice. Uh, my family, they were hard workers, so you know, to be successful, you have to work the land, you have to work together. And so while certain families worked together, did labor work, then I had another grandmother that did the cooking for everybody. So we would all go to her home after, after the day's work, and everybody would eat together, and then while the, while the um, women were cleaning up, my, one of my grandfathers would bring out his um, accordion or um, his guitar, build a fire, and then we would play outside and um, calm down for the, for the evening and then walk home. So my memories were a large, if you can imagine, a large pit fire uh, good memories with music, laughter, lots of laughter, uh, lots of hard work. I mean, even the small ones were 
had had a job to do, and that was to make sure that the dogs stayed away from the jerky, or from the, the deer meat that was hanging on the clothesline so that the dogs wouldn't eat it, so they would stay out all day and dry. So a um, lot of good memories. So, but that was all taken away. Uh, the Relocation Act of 1956, or what you call the Public Law 951, or the Adult Vocational Training Program, came about. And it came about because the federal government wanted the natives off the reservations. Different ways, different thoughts, different communications of how they wanted the natives to come off the reservations um, occurred. And so my dad and my mom, they really had to think hard, do we really want to go out into a city? Do we want to move my family to a city? And of course, living on the reservation, there's not a lot of employment opportunities. Limited, you know. I mean, you're, you're very fortunate if you had a job on the reservation to sustain your family and maintain, um, maintain life. Because without money, you don't have food and whatnot. You know, you can't take care of your family. But we were, we were pretty prosperous despite that. But however, there were child care issues where my grandmother had to take care of us. And she did. And while my parents left and to the cities to work, and then they would come back <coughs> and be with us. So we formed a very strong family bond and had very tight relationships. And so after a while, after much thought and concentrate and, and, and discussions with, the, with my grandmothers and, and all the family members, my parents decided to move. We came out on the relocation program in 1962. Uh, we came out on a train. There were eight children. I was the oldest of eight children. And when we came, the Relocation Bureau of Indian Affairs had told my family that they would have housing available and they would have jobs. And when we arrived, there was nothing, absolutely nothing. They gave my parents a hotel voucher. We stayed in the Bel Air Hotel on, I think it's 98th Avenue and Bancroft for, I'm gonna say six months before we were able to find a, a suitable place. Because they wanted, they wanted us to put, they, they wanted to put my family in uh, West Oakland. But my, my mom says, no, you know, we just came from the reservation. We are not going to be living here. And um, it was, they put us, found, found a place, my mom described it as rat infested, roaches and whatnot. And she says, no, I'm not, I, you know, I work hard. I'm not, we're not gonna live there. So we stayed in the hotel. My dad looked for work and eventually we got into, a, uh, we found a place. And my parents worked two jobs apiece. I stayed home and helped out with my, I, since I was the oldest. I helped out a lot with childcare. And during that time, my mom was pregnant. She had another child. She didn't know anything about birth control, you know? And if she did, she probably, she told us, I would have never had any of you, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, she loved every one of us. She loved us to death. So, at that time in the, in the 60s, there was a lot of um, anger, you know, um, with a lot of the, the, the parents that came um, through the relocation program. So protesting happened. Um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was located in Alameda. I don't know if many of you know where Crab Cove is um, in South Shore. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was located there, and there you would find find hundreds of Indians protesting because of the conditions, the employment and the housing, school and whatnot. And so a lot of people got to meet one another 
different tribes, all different tribes, all walks of life. And so there emerged the Intertribal Friendship House, which is still exists on Fifth Avenue in Oakland. The Indian Baptist churches in Oakland and San Francisco. There was so much, and, and it wasn't about religion, it was about being together from whether you're of a different tribe or whether of your, your same tribe or relatives. It was about community and it was about being together. And so my family became a part of that because my parents really missed home. But they knew they couldn't survive back home as well with nine children now. And so we lived in, in Oakland um, and grew up in Oakland. We never left Oakland. It took my parents six years to save enough money to get a wagon, a station wagon, and drive home for the first time to see my relatives. And boy, that was just a, a wonderful feeling to see back home back again. And so coming out on the relocation program, I was 10 years of age. And some of you have children. Can you imagine what it was like 10 years of age to have to move from your home into a new area? I mean, I had seen, I had never seen so many different colors of flowers. I had never seen different colors of homes, different colors of people different nationalities. The bus system, oh my God, that was such the scariest thing, to get on the bus to go from San Leandro to Oakland on 13th Street to visit my, to, to um, see, my, see my aunt. My cousin took me, no one explained to us, no one told us, oh, well this is how you get you know, from here, A to Z. And so I was traumatized. I, oh my God, I was, I was crying because my thing is that we're being taken away again. And, and, I, and I didn't realize that it was just a, you know, you just take the bus, pay your money, and go to the next route. So I had to learn all these scenes and, and grew up in a, in a world that I knew nothing about at such a young, such a young age. And then also my parents having to navigate, you know, um, looking for financial resources to maintain um, housing for our family. So we grew up poor, but I never knew that because we had so much love in our family. Um, but I can tell you one thing, growing up, by the time I reached 11th grade, I didn't want to have no more beans because <laughs> every it seems like we just grew up on beans, 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 you know. But my mom was a good baker, so she would bake bread, and so that and tortillas. So we always had plenty of of um, that kind of food. Uh, when we go to the grocery store, it wasn't about it wasn't about buying frozen foods or or anything like that because we couldn't afford it. She would buy. 20 pounds, 25 pounds, 50 pounds of flour, because that would have to last her for the month. So she, she was constantly thinking about how, how to plan ahead. But that's how we grew up, and that's how they grew up as well, being, living on a farm. And so during that time, uh, as we were uh, living here, um, my father became very involved, very active with the um, relocation program and wanting better things for um, the families. So as a result, like I mentioned, Intertribal Friendship House and then the churches, but also um, different um, agencies started evolving, little, little by little. There was a Navajo club at that time Hundreds of Navajo families gotten together. I mean, we used to, um, nowadays you guys call it party, but we used to go to Redwood, Redwood Park. And someone would go there at 6 o'clock in the morning and reserve a spot. And so all the families would go there eventually throughout the day. And they would buy, um, um, uh, get pits together. And they would 
cook all day long just because it reminded them of back home. And they would speak Navajo all day, you know, and just have jokes and have fun. My dad and, and his friend, we would go and we, they found a place in Fremont. Fremont used to be a farmland. And buy a sheep and butcher a couple of sheep. Well, that's how we got to learn how to cut up a sheep and clean it and whatnot. And then bring it back to the park and then they would have fresh barbecue um, uh, mutton and the rest of the food. So as a result of that, that um, connection, up, um, there became connections with families. So not only did you learn your clan families, but families got to know one another really well. So as we grew up, we all know each other as cousins, but really we're not cousins. We just, our families became that close that we um, related to one another. Then, the, then my dad had uh, started up a school called Deneb Biolta, which is called Navajo School, and that was um, first um, organized at the church on the corner um, off of High Street and um, I think it's uh, High Street and Foothill. There's a church there. That was the first school. So that lasted for a couple of years, uh, and then it, it broke down because of funding. But in the meantime, many other things came involved. You know, then became the Native American Health Center, American Indian Child Resource Center, um, United Indian Nations, uh, American Indian Film Festival Institute. All those evolved around the 60s. And now we're all in our 40 or 50th anniversary, still existing, because we still have a community. But I also see you know, like walking down the street, you know, I, when I was driving with my children because I, I swore I would have, I would go to school, I would work hard, I was always encouraged to get an education. I did. I received my bachelor's and I received my master's. And I'm grateful for that. <laughs> but I also wanted to have my children know that um, it was not easy. And so, and I didn't want them to take things for granted. And so as we, as I drive down the streets, um, they would see um, people pushing the carts, you know, um, families, mothers with clothes, with groceries. And um, they go, oh, mom, look at that, you know? And I said, no shame in that, because you know what, that was us. That was me. That was our first vehicle here in the city. And you have to do what you have to do. And that's what we did. We would take a grocery cart. My mom would go and check out a grocery cart, wherever neighborhood. And she would pile, with nine kids, you had tons of groceries. I mean, tons of clothes. And then she would set us up at the laundromat, and then we would have to wash clothes and then bring them home. We would go to the grocery store and pack up our groceries in there. With nine kids, it's just not a couple of bags, it's tons of bags. And so we would push the carts home and then our job was to take them back to the grocery store to make sure they got there. So we would have, they would, the grocery store manager would trust us that we would bring them back. So those were things that we did and I see that now and I see a lot of our um, immigrants that come through, you know, they're surviving just like we survived. And that's how you do it. You have communities, you have programs. And so eventually we all, collab you know, uh, the goal was to uh, totally assimilate us, but we didn't get assimilated. We acculturated. We adapted to this environment. One of the struggles that I have um, and that um, my family, we all talk about now and then, is the language. You know, my dad is Navajo, which the, 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 the language is very different from Laguna Pueblo language. 
Like for example, my dad would say yat e, which means hello, and my mom would say guazi, totally different. And so there were arguments between my parents as to what language we would speak. And it turned out that we end up having to speak English, you know. Although some of us now as adults, we want to go back and we want to, you know, pick up our, our language. I still have good sound memories because when I go back home, I can kind of understand what my families are talking, you know, what my relatives are, what they're saying, you know, because you have that memory back in your mind. And I can say some words, but not, you know, not to be able to carry on a conversation, but, you know, just to kind of get a, a, an idea of what they're talking about. But it's good to have that, you know, and if you have an opportunity to keep your language, keep your language. Um, one of the other things that we talked about um, is uh, our, our last name. Our last name we learned through um, going to school. You know, of course, you never, you never know what your, um, you know, they never talk about American Indians. And when they talk about American Indians, it's always about the teepee and, um, and dancing around. And, and I thought, oh, God, are we, you know, we don't, we didn't live in teepees, you know? And so a lot of my friends had always, their parents have thought about like, well, how did you grow up? How did you live in a teepee? You know, and I go, well, we never, we, we didn't have teepees. We had um, adobe homes. And so it's, a, and as I start to meet other nationalities, it start to be very um, clear that, you know, that we are really different. Um, in my fourth grade class, I remember, um, the teacher wanted me to come up and introduce myself and tell me a little bit about where I came from. And when I did, the whole class laughed. Because when I went up to speak, I said, I have, you know, I come from New Mexico and um, a place called Laguna. And I have six grandmothers and six grandfathers. And they just, they thought, and the teacher thought I was making, making a joke. And so she sent me, she stopped me and she goes, I'm sorry, you need to go to the principal's office. They had to call my mom, my mom went to the school. And she says, yes, she has six grandmothers and six grandfathers. In our, in our, in our tradition, in our, and in, in how I, in my mind, how I grew up is that my grandmother's sisters are all my grandmothers, and their husbands were my grandfathers. So yes, I did. In Laguna Way, I was right. So in that respect, nowadays, um, I teach my own kids. You know, like Maria, that's their little mom. The children, my grandchildren, that's their grandmother. And so we carry that on in our family, and we teach our relatives that come from the outside um, the same traditions that we grew up with. However, the difference is not everybody understands that. So this is just something in our family, and this is something within our American Indian, our, our, Navajo, our Laguna Navajo. Because not only do you have that relationship, you also have your clan relatives. And don't ever forget about your clan relatives because you're part of that. You're part of that connection. And so when you meet somebody, you always let them know what kind of what clan you are, so that you do not intermarry into that clan, because otherwise you're marrying a relative. So my rel my my clan is on the Laguna side, it's Sinohano. On the Navajo side, it's Kiaani. So just, you know, I, I don't know if you have any of that um, type of thing, but those are some of the things that relocation program never took away from us. And, and I'm glad that our younger generation is very strong with that as well and continue with those traditions. So our last name, Spencer, that's my maiden name, um, 
it, and we actually asked my dad, where did that come from? Because, you know, that's an English, you know, English name. And he says, well, actually, through, as they went through the, um, as we started to talk about what had happened early, in the early um, years, um, and started learning that my dad had actually, was a victim of boarding school. Uh, he, actually, both my parents were victims of boarding school. Um, my dad's last name was actually, the English name was Cowboy. And when I, when I first went back home to meet my um, Navajo side of the family, they were all cowboys. I mean, they, they were raised with horses. And some of them went on to do championship um, rodeo. So, um, so our real name is Cowboy. And then the fishbowl name, which they put in the fishbowl, they, you know, um, and took out their name, and this is what your name is. And so our last name became Spencer. So that's how we got our last name. Uh, and it's interesting how relocation, you know, brought, brought us all together and how we learned, you know, the, the devastations that our parents endured, you know, with, with boarding schools and whatnot. And I, and I thought I never knew that my mom was a boarding school, but after living with her and growing up with both my parents, I started to realize, like, wow, really had a traumatic, traumatic experience with them. And being taken away from your families and not seeing your family for a whole year as a young child, that's traumatizing. And we see, and we still see it today. You know, um, the children being taken away um, on the border, you know, it's sad to see. So, relocation was good in some sense and not good in some sense, but I think that the government hasn't really looked at that and realized like how traumatizing that experience have been with our families. But despite the experience with our families, um, my family um, stayed strong and stayed connected as much as they could. And so I'm glad I'm up here standing and here with my sister-in-law and our families. But thank you very much. Um, for this opportunity to talk about my relocation experience. Um, it was very different. And, and I, I, I did feel different. I did feel different. I felt alienated. I felt, um, growing up in Oakland, I felt isolated. Um, I felt like my voice wasn't heard. And so I, I think to this day, you know, it's good that we have these Native American student organizations. And um, because it gives you guys a voice to speak up and to know that we're still here. Our Thank next you. Speaker, our next speaker, for sure. Uh, and she has become a mentor for our Inner Tribal Student Union Club. Um, we are really blessed to have Dr. Melinda Miko, who's seminal. Uh, from the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. She's also been uh, our benefactor for our contribution of Native American books in our library that uh, she gifted us, and we gifted it right back to Merritt College for other students to use. Um, she has um, put together a film trailer and discussion, which is about the refining, refinery healing walks, Idle No More, San Francisco Bay Area, organized from 2014 uh, to 2017 to bring attention to the five refineries in the Bay Area and their contributions to climate chaos and challenges of funding uh, documentary and the importance of indigenous perspectives in the environment, environmental movement. Because I think she um, really is going to get ready to spring forward with this film in the future. It's the trailer of what she's working on right now. Um, she's got also going to talk a little bit more in detail about the challenges and 
the long road that it takes to actually put a film, a short documentary, just like the one that you saw earlier. So there's a lot that goes involved. So come on up, uh, Dr. Uh, Miko, and um, she's going to, we're going to show her a clip. Hold on. Thank you. Um, I also thank Maria um, and the student group, the intertribal student group. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we are on um, occupied Ohlone territory and recognize too that all this land is really Indian land. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about working on this uh, documentary. My co-director, uh, Chihiro Wimbush, um, an Emmy-nominated uh, director, cinematographer, for his film, Dogtown Redemption, which was West Oakland Recyclers. And how difficult it is to make a documentary, particularly when you're in an indigenous community and you're an outsider to that community. Uh, many of us in indigenous nations have people who want to come in and film, our communities, of course they want to film our ceremonies and various things like that. So we have to be very careful with people who are outsiders to our community. So when Chihiro approached the grandmothers, I'm one of the grandmothers from Idle No More SF Bay, about doing a documentary, um, he said he was interrogated and grilled about what his purpose was, what his viewpoint would be, what he would want to do. And the grandmother said, well, there's only one of our grandmothers who's made a documentary, and it's Melinda, so you should work with her. So we've been working together uh, to fund this documentary. We originally thought we'd do a half hour documentary, but it ended up with us interviewing six people from the community, a lot of detail about it, and we knew that we couldn't do it in a half an hour. So we have a half an hour rough cut of our film, which you're not going to see today, but you're going to see the sample of our documentary. We're organizing a GoFundMe page. We spent a year and a half writing grants to fund our documentary, and very frustrated. We were, I think about four or five of them, we were on the short list, but in the end, we, we weren't chosen for that. So we went back to square one, and we were able to find some funding for the first half of the film, and then now we're gonna be doing fundraising to complete the film. And we want to complete it to start entering it in film, documentary film festivals in the spring. So most of the time, this is really a labor of love. Anybody in here want to be a documentary filmmaker? Anybody have any interest in that? Yay, okay, over there, yay, wonderful. So just know, get your funding ahead of time, because when you do it halfway in, it's really challenging. So I, I want to, Ross is going to play um, the, the sample documentary, and then if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer. Hey, Chevron. Hello, we have a fire. My husband was outside working on the garden and I heard this loud boom and saw this big black piece of smoke coming towards the house. I was actually terrified at that moment, one of the very few times in my life that I experienced fear. I was terrified for my community. It was a major, major situation that caused much harm, but it also activated, reactivated our community. After that happened, it was so in my face that there was no way that my attention was ever going to waver from all of the refineries that are here. It's like a third world setup where you have these huge corporations with all this money controlling the political operations at the disempowerment and to the damage of the local populations. Out of my mouth came the idea for the refinery healing walks to connect one fossil fuel impacted community to another. Until the healing walks, people in the different communities never had really worked together on these issues. This brought all these communities together. For me, living in Richmond and raising my children there, there was always a sense of kind of being 
a small town faced with a gigantic, huge corporation and refinery. And it's a very different feeling now to know that all of the towns along the refinery corridor are deeply connected and working together. We're a nonviolent organization, but we're led by grandmothers. We went back to matriarchal ways of doing things. What we're doing is just reasserting what's been tradition. I'm part of this wonderful, beautiful group led by these wise, wise grandmothers. I'm walking for my ancestors and for my future generations. The Healing Walk journey has meant for me the nurturing and mentoring of our young ones who've taken the baton and now they're going forward and spreading this like a huge spider web that connects us all. institutions that we submitted an application for ask us, and they're heavily funded by the Koch brothers, if you know who the Koch brothers are, who are very much in support of the extractive fossil fuel industries. Um, if we had interviewed people at Chevron, it's like, no, we haven't, because we know their bottom line. We know how they've tried to shape the political agenda in Richmond by throwing millions of dollars at it. It would be, we, we have their pet answers for everything. Although over the years that we did this, when we first did a year after the explosion in 2013, we, there was a huge march that was organized to march to Chevron. Led by Native grandmothers and our eight brothers were behind us, protecting us and singing their aim song. Um, and when we got to Chevron, they were much more oppositional to us at that time. Um, and there were over 200 people arrested that day. One was a 90-something grandmother who said, I want to be arrested to show my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, um, that I stood up and that, that I was there. Since then, we've always talked to whatever sheriff, police department, Chevron, whatever refinery we've gone to, and we talked to the refinery workers and say, we're praying for you. We're praying for you to have a just transition into sustainable economies. Um, because there's always the fear among refinery workers. I've got to feed my children. I've got to feed my family. 
And we're actually showing them there's ways that you can have really solid, good jobs in things that are not extractive economies. Um, as we've seen recently with the fires in California and the explosion at the New Star storage tank that just happened in September, things are rapidly speeding up in terms of more destruction to the environment. And we have a very short time to turn that around. So what we're trying to do is show people ways that they can turn it around without eliminating their, their jobs. And um, I'd like to thank both uh, Ross and other people um, as single parents. I went back to school as a single mom and um, actually raised my children at UC Berkeley, basically, while they were watching their mom get a PhD. So thank you to single parents who have a huge job to do. Um, and also my children say, and my grandchildren too, I said, you know, it's up to you to carry this baton. And my grandson was actually, he was really kind of acting up at one of our refinery walks. And one of the grandmothers got down to him on his level and talked to him. We don't know what she said to him, and she can't remember what she said to him, but she gave him the staff to carry. And then my daughter was crying, and I said, what are you crying about? She said, I don't know what they said, what, what she said to Finley. But all of a sudden, he straightened his back, he took that staff, and he led the walk. So it's our responsibility as a grandmother that I show him one that his grandmother stood up for him and all the grandmothers, native grandmothers, and also that we're in the front of the march Except for the march in September, the youth called a climate strike, and we went to support them. Instead of being the grandmothers in front, we put the youth in front. Because they called the strike, they asked for it, so we wanted to, to highlight them. It, it's a, I don't think it's as dangerous. We, we've tried to get arrested in San Francisco, but you know they don't want to arrest us. But in other areas, the people in the Amazon are being murdered. Um, one of our sisters up in Canada, Conahus, recently was arrested. She was thrown down, her wrist was broken. Another one of our frontline activists, Sharif Waitlin, who is in the other half of our film, she works on the Bayou Bridge in Louisiana. She's had to move out of Louisiana because of death threats and charges to her family. So now she's living in secret. So these are the threats to our frontline activists that we in the Bay Area bubble aren't experienced, but it's real threats and real dangers, and people are losing their lives to save the environment. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the girls that you have? Yes, I will. Thank you very much, Maria, for bringing this up. After every walk, and by the way, each walk was between 9 and 13 miles, and um, people walked that. The grandmothers walked that. People walked that. I was in the support car because I'd had surgery on my knees, so I couldn't walk it. But at the end of each walk, we ask everyone, what do you envision for the future? And we had these muslin squares, and we had people design them, and then we made quilts out of them so we can show, what are you actually doing? So these are, what do I imagine the world to be? And then the, these are the baby quilts that we use the children's uh, muslin images. Um, so it's a real way to say, we're not against people who are working in extractive economies, but we want to say what is the transition and where are we going? What do we want for our future? And none of us want this continuing fire danger and the pollution and the explosions. Chevron gets the most attention because they had the biggest explosion. But since 1984, um, in the last five, I'd say five to seven years, there have been more explosions at all the refineries than from 1984 to 2019. So people think it's going away, it's ratcheting up. So the dangers are becoming ever more real in terms of fossil fuel industries. And also, too, the um, Continued creation, right now ConocoPhillips, Phillips 66, is asking for a wharf expansion so they can bring in more tankers of tar sands. And tar sands, as you know, are very dirty, and they're also very disruptive to indigenous communities because that's where they're extracting uh, the tar sands that's coming from Canada down. So they want to dredge the entire San Francisco Bay to bring in these big tankers 
and to increase double the amount of tankers to come in to that. So to, tonight, there's actually a meeting in Pinole um, to fight against that and to resist against that and say, no, we don't want a wharf expansion. We don't want dredging that will come in because when you dredge everything that's a bottom of the ocean, including the things from the gold industry are settled down in the bottom of the bay. So if you dredge, all of that's gonna come up and it's gonna be even more dangerous to the fish and the um, ecological systems that we have in the bay are even more in danger. Our work, we've done uh, most of our work in kind. We haven't received money for it. Um, it's not my full-time job, my co-director is. His job is a filmmaker. Um, so what we're trying to do is raise the money. Most documentaries, particularly hour-long documentaries, are 150 to 300,000. And we're doing ours for probably around 50,000 for the full hour, which is incredibly cheap. Um, but we do need the funding to finish this because it's really important that people understand what's in your backyard and that people know about it. And people that know how to resist, but using nonviolent direct actions. Um, we won't let anyone in our group or come to one of our actions who wants to, who risks arrest, who hasn't been through training. And we do trainings all the time nonviolent direct action trainings, particularly right before a big action. And I Don't Know More SF Bay um, is asked to participate all the time, um, throughout the world too. We've sent two of our young people to COP23, which is the big um, international conference that really addresses climate change and what you need to do and who's gonna sign and who's gonna abide by the Kyoto Protocols which Trump has decided no, he's not, gonna, he's not gonna have the US involved in that. So we're involved in things on a local level, inspiring people to see what you can do on your local level, but connected to global movements. We certainly got our inspiration from Idle No More um, that was founded in Canada by three First Nations women and one woman who calls herself a settler uh, woman, white woman. Um, so it's, Something that we start in very, and there's only 20 of us, I should say, and I don't know more SFA, there's 20 people in our core group, and we put on these huge actions. Most of the uh, crew that's refined in the Bay Area is not for domestic use. It goes to China and it goes to India. So we're not even pre for uh, preparing or creating or refining oil that's gonna be used in the United States. And we also need to put a lot more money into sustainable economies, economies, electric cars, solar energies, wind energy, which some tribes now are doing, particularly ones in the um, Midwest where they have tremendous winds in there and they can use wind power. So I think just showing people what the possible solutions are is we can't just say, well, stop it, because we have to have some solutions for that can't say you just need to stop this right now, because even switching to non-extractive economies takes some buildup and takes some work, and probably also will require some of the fossil fuel burning industries before you can make, make that switch. So we're not leaving people in the, um, you know, just open to anything we want. We really want to propose some solutions. One thing that we do too, and I don't know more, um, the grandmothers got together with indigenous women north and south and signed a treaty in 2015 during the climate week in, in New York. And part of that obligation of those who signed the treaty, and I'm a signatory on that treaty, is that every new moon we pray for the water. We always do it at Cesar Chavez Park. You're all welcome, please come. And we just pray for the water. And then part of that process is telling about the obligation of the treaty that we have. And then also, though, sharing the good news. You know, things that people are moving. Germany is moving away from coal plants completely. And so giving people hope that there are people that are making change. There are countries that are making those changes. And then every equinox and every solstice, we have a direct action to those communities or those institutions that are causing the greatest harm. 
So last December, we went and sang carols at the um, governor-elect Gavin Newsom's house, and the carols were all adjusted to um, the words of, of him to be a climate hero. And we asked him, rather than the, what Governor Brown had done, we want him to really switch that and change that. Uh, and hopefully he will do it. We've asked for a meeting with Governor Newsom, which hasn't happened. We also tried to get through his wife, who was there and is also a documentary filmmaker, to see if she could get her husband to meet with the grandmothers of Ida Moore and just hear what we have to say. But we show up for all the actions, the Bay Area, Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Uh, when they're doing something, we'll show up in numbers and present. And what we're doing too as grandmothers is training the next generation. You saw the two young women, Isabella Zizi, who went to Bonn, Germany for COP23, and Brianna Ruiz. As part of our grandmothers, we're training the next generation. So this last year, we've been having 15 workshops in how to train our young ones for police liaison, for social media, for um, nonviolent direct action, all kinds of the movements, previous movements. We did a whole evening on the American Indian movement and just getting our young people trained in ways so that now they're taking the leadership roles. The grandmas are kind of, okay, we're getting up there in age, we kind of want to sit back, I'm retired now. I don't think I've been as busy in retirement as I was as a professor, um, but it's a good busy. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maria.